does not want a diary of everything you did over the last four years. Mm -hmm. We want a story. We want a succinct Put a box story. around it. Yeah. And the fact that you went through 50 failed experiments until you got the one that worked, we don't necessarily need to know that unless it's a methods paper that that's important. Uh, focus on the story. And I think this goes back to your question is if you know what your story is that you're trying to tell, that will help you know when you can stop mm -hmm. the experiments and write it up. But at the same time, once you've submitted your story in that paper, still do those experiments in preparation that the reviewers may ask for more mm -hmm. tests. And then you would be prepared for that. I think it's difficult to answer, but there's definitely a balance. You know, some people just keep publishing incrementally, and it's really annoying. Yeah, it's very annoying. But you can't just wait for 50 years to publish. You yeah. know, you have to. I did. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're a dean, but, but but you know, you have to. You know. But the other thing is, the other thing is, is that coming incrementally and trying to get like 50 page papers out of a single experiment, you, you have to be careful about that mm -hmm. because. Most reviewers, if they're you know, your peers and experts in the field, will realize what you're doing and they will call you on it and go, look, you have the data, you propose a few questions and you're only looking at one of them here. Why don't you do all of them in this single paper and do a full synthesis? And I have rejected a paper before where they came back and says, Oh, well, we, we feel that's beyond the scope of a single paper, and we want to do that in a second paper. And I go, well, then you can submit this paper to another journal and try to get it published there as well. Because it really wasn't that high quality to begin with, and they're playing the game to try to get as, as many publications as they can. And I wasn't going to be a part of it. Is it generally like the rule? So you know how like you can have if you have three chapters in your dissertation, you have three publications, then that's your dissertation. Yeah. But is generally like each chapter your own and a single <coughs> publication or it, sometimes there's no the, rule of thumb. Yeah, that's sort of the average. Yeah. But there can always be exceptions of yeah. if it was one particularly complex set of experiments that led to a really sophisticated analysis and it's kind of one paper yeah. you know so, so but, but generally a PhD yeah. is three papers. I guess like okay, so what I'm saying is like if if what I have constitutes a chapter of my dissertation that generally like would hmm. correlate to a single publication. It depends typically Typical. but it may Typical. actually just be part of one publication. Okay. And yeah. sometimes if you do write a 1500 word high profile paper you want to write some you know a longer paper as a companion because you couldn't put much into that paper so sometimes it could be two papers I guess yeah um, I like to see the, the the chapters of publications in a fourth one that actually you know there should be some kind of theme to all these things you yeah. know and that that may or may not be a publication but, yeah. but certainly it, it allows you to actually you know, weave a, weave a yeah. larger story yeah, you you know, amongst people. You want some sort of synthesis of everything as, mm -hmm. as to why these were interconnected. Sometimes people publish their literature reviews, which I'm not a big fan of, you know, yeah. when you do an introduction chapter. Yeah, I mean, some people encourage that, some people don't. I mean, usually review papers uh, are, uh, you know, uh, every few years there's a new review paper that's, that's published, and they're, they're worthwhile because they give people that aspect. Kind of getting around what you just said, Steve, like, say, say you have, like, three chapters in your dissertation, and they all have some overriding theme, but they all stand alone as their own, you know, manuscripts that can be published. Like, how do you go about having, like, that fourth publication that basically describes everything you've already published? It doesn't uh, have to be. Yeah, it it, well, make what, I think what Steve was talking about was the last chapter of your dissertation. Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a single paper that synthesizes all the previous stuff. Unless you have a, uh, they were so groundbreaking and interconnected that there has to be a synthesis paper to combine it all and then you add some more stuff to that. Yeah. I think it comes back to storytelling. You know, we, if I measure five elements in these samples, is the story about all five of them or are the five completely different stories about five of them? Yeah. You know, do you write five papers or one paper? 
you know, I, I could see, for example, in my field, you know, writing three, you know, fishery journal papers, and then maybe, you know, if the synthesis is important, writing it for, like, Fisheries Magazine, yeah. which is a, a more um, eclectic readership, you know, in terms of, you know, why, why is work in this general area important, and what's the state of a little bit less focused on like the actual data and really make that more focused on yeah, yeah. more more on, on the the overarching um, right. nature of the problem that connects them yeah but not everybody has no. I mean sometimes there are three papers that may share a technique but are on completely different mm -hmm. yeah. subjects and that's perfectly fine too yeah. I want to make a comment on on that as well and that is is that um, different professors have different mm -hmm. requirements in terms of what they are expecting from their students and and sometimes it isn't always communicated so one of the best ways to get that in your head is the is the old template method which is uh, look through the dissert theses and dissertations mm -hmm. produced by other people from your lab if unless you're you know you're Professor Brendan, <laughs> but uh, yeah. the the other thing is is that this kind of the standard template is the introductory chapter that says you know why you're doing it mm -hmm. and why you did these things and and what chapter two three and four are going to do and then chapter five at least your overall conclusions and if you can bring it together and mm -hmm. you know how useful this technique was or, or whatever that that kind of the even though we're talking about three chapters or three publications mm -hmm. you really are looking for five chapters and probably uh, uh, an appendix with some some of your uh, details in it that, that don't actually go in the papers yeah I mean, the, so, so the other thing with writing is that it's sometimes easy to follow a template, but sometimes you have to go outside the template oh, to absolutely. write. So, so let the story tell itself the way yeah. the story needs to be told. So I hate papers which separate results from discussion. <laughs> because especially if you have a lot of results, I mean, that's the old-fashioned way to do yeah. it. So you have all your results presented, and then you have a long discussion of those results referring back to all the figures which you've already presented. And that just gets so hard to make the connection back and forth. So I like to combine those, and most journals now encourage that, so that you are presenting the results, and then what are the implications of these results, and kind of have a more organic flow to your writing. Uh, but, you know, I, I, tell, I tell students all the time, if writing to a template gets you writing to begin with, that's good. Do whatever gets you to get words on the computer, mm -hmm. and then we can play around with mm -hmm. editing it and moving things around to get it to flow better. I would say that the, um, the basis for your, this dissertation is really the contract that you have mm -hmm. between you your major professor and the committee, which is your dissertation proposal. And I like to see them kind of as living documents. Because, you know, I mean, it's one thing to write a proposal to say I'm going to do all this, yeah. but then you get into the middle of it, yeah. and it's like, you know, that's not working. I need to blame that. Change, well, yeah. the, you know, you can change the proposal. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and that way at the, at, when mm -hmm. you approach the end, there's no um, sort of, you know, missed expectations of what you're actually going to do. And so I, I'd say, you know, kind of focus on that. You know, um, that, that's your contract with, with the people that count, you know, and so, so use that as an opportunity. And that's one of the reasons why you're supposed to have a committee meeting every year. Yeah. Yeah. Is so right. when you have these kinds of, if you have or things more that often. need to be changed. Or more often. <laughs> yeah, and you, you don't turn up with a publication that one of your committee members says, well, this is wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think the panel's done a great job pointing out all of the challenges associated with scientific publishing these days. Don't be snarky, do be leery. It can take 10 years. <laughs> How much pain can you endure? <laughs> so it's tough stuff. I wondered if somebody would comment on or just share a story about a publication experience that was positive and that you're really proud of and why that was. 
Because I know the first time I got a byline in a newspaper, that was a big day. That was a cool thing. And so I think sharing a positive story would be fun to hear. Oh, you know, I, I, I'm very conflicted about nature. I was very excited when I got a paper published in Nature, but I also think that a lot of things in Nature end up being wrong. Yeah. Um, but I have to say that that this paper that I just got published was really like it was a combination of a review article and pulling just all sorts of different fields <coughs> together. And I had a reviewer who really didn't like the first draft, but recognized it as important. And this guy stuck with me, and he gave, you know, he put a lot of time into it, and I responded to his reviews, and we went back and forth three times. Um, and then I ended up nominating him for a uh, uh, you know, good reviewer award. Yeah. Editor citation, yeah. yeah. And um, he got it. So that was a, you know, this was a reviewer who was really harsh the first time around. And it was like, okay, that means I'm not explaining this well. And, you know, we, we worked through it. So that was, a, that was a really positive experience of the review process improving a paper that was really important to me. I actually find the review process quite positive usually in that, you know, I get really angry when I first read the reviews, regardless <laughs> of what they say. But, you know, often they're usually constructive. They usually improve the paper, They things I haven't thought of. Um, in terms of my, my favorite paper, you know, I share the same sort of concerns about nature, and I have a nature paper with 1,500 data points. I have another paper in GCA which has something like 10 data points, and it's 10 times as long. And it's great because I'm... You know, I could just dump all these things I was thinking. It's almost like a review, but it's new ideas. And I really enjoyed writing that because I could get out all these ideas. And so, you know, longer papers can be really nice to write. Hmm. <laughs> Not for the editor. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank on my most positive because I frankly have generally positive experiences with the publication process. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know... Most will have to go back for major revision at least once. But again, all the editor, all the reviewers and editors have really good comments, and there's stuff that I thought either I could slip by without them commenting on, or uh, stuff I hadn't thought of. And so it definitely does make the paper better. So I do like the peer review process. I haven't really encountered any much snark or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I can't really think of one that's most positive. I can think of a couple of negative ones, but I won't <laughs> express that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's generally a quite a positive experience, yeah, yeah. really. Of, of you know. what, you know, you're most proud, like the IPCC report. Yeah, well, I mean, I was proud of being part of that, uh, but, you know, probably one of my most proud papers were some of my first ones that I published, mm -hmm. which are kind of in areas of research I don't even do anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this. Thanks for the question, Kristen, because uh, um, this is not root canal. You know, I mean, this is yeah, this yeah. is this is what we do, right? And and I do think that you know, for people just starting, um, publications are your four hundred one k. They will travel with you no matter where you go, and they will be your written legacy when you die, right? And so they will be out there. So you know, take pride in those, and it's worth doing. Uh, I'll I'll cite an example of a, a publication that. Uh, I'm proud of. And that's a publication that came out last year. Um, and it describes a lot of the research that we've been doing here since I came. And uh, originally I tried it in PNAS and it was rejected. So I sent it to Marine and Coastal Fisheries and it got published. And it actually was just nominated as one of the 10 best papers of the decade um, uh, in that journal. So persist, persist. Can I share one? Yeah. I mean, I'm pointing it on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> when I first, when I went for my postdoc, so I hit upon a problem. It had nothing to do with my postdoc, nothing to do with my dissertation. And I worked on this, and I, my first um, sole authored paper, okay, and I sent it off to JGR um, Oceans. And 
the and this is the days where you got snail mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God, think about the review process the then. Form. And I got a letter back from the editor that said, um, I read this paper uh, thoroughly myself, and it doesn't require review. I've accepted it. <laughs> wow. So, you know, wow. So, yeah. But you know the thing is, what that is a first year postdoc, my first sole authored paper. What that did for my confidence yeah. Yeah. It was remarkable. It was just wonderful. And I suspect to this day that editor knew exactly. Yeah, um, very possibly, yeah. Just one of the kindest things yeah. I think I've ever experienced. So very positive. I find that each paper has its own kind of theme, the way the, the story is set out, and they all feel different. The idea comes out of your head. It, it's almost like when you're a musician making albums, they all have a yeah. slightly different, that's how I like to think of it. So I enjoy that process, you know. If you've distilled your thoughts on that problem into the paper, they're sort of gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah, uh, I have a question if any of you have any thoughts on or experience with pre-registration. So for people that might not know what that is, um, it's gained a lot of traction in especially psychology because uh, they tried to replicate a lot of studies and they didn't hold up and it's related to kind of the bias around publishing positive results, mm. either through going, you know, where people doesn't seem important, we go on and we try something else until we find our story. So, um, and also journals won't accept it. So. Uh, if it doesn't show some interesting positive result. So pre-registration is where upfront you put online, usually online, or submit to a journal what your data is going to be, how you're going to analyze it, and then um, some journals will actually accept it just based on the merits of method, uh, but I'm, rather than what, the, what your discussion is later or the statistical significance. I was wondering if any of you had any thoughts on that, if you find that useful, if you find it restrictive in that it kind of locks you into one way and you might not know exactly how you're going to analyze things later on. Yeah, I frankly had never heard of that. Uh, I'm not sure how well it would work in a, uh, a lot of our fields here. Mm -hmm. I can see why the uh, psychology and some of their experiments may have been going to that because of the replicability problem. Uh, whereas if they put their data out there and their methods and people can comment on whether those are valid and appropriate. Mm -hmm. But then again, at the same time, a lot of their data has to be carefully screened to make sure that there's not identifying marks either. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not, I mean, we all share our data. I mean, most of the data that we use is open to everybody to look at it. Mm -hmm. Our methods are generally open as well. Uh, we just don't necessarily go about putting it on a specific site. I don't know. I've also not heard of it. Uh, the way chemical oceanography is going, and often it's <coughs> not a requirement by NSF, it's favorable to NSF, is that all the data for field programs needs to go to the to the data office no. ma managed by HUI, or for Geotraces it goes to the, the da Geotraces International Data Office in the UK, and all that data is downloadable, even if you haven't published it. And I mean, there are sort of issues with that because anyone can use it, but it, it's all available mm -hmm. um, online in that sense. Experimental data is a bit more, a bit harder to do. But for example, the, the data office will have different projects and, you know, they really encourage making data available through these international sites, not just the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and in, in, in fact, you know, we haven't even mentioned data policy with journals, but almost all major journals now require that the data be publicly available. Uh, and if it is not in a public archive, uh, then it has to, it's not acceptable. I mean, I, I actually had a paper from the OSNAP that I would not accept until they made their data available on the archive because NSF told, required them to do it within two years of collecting, and this was three years after that had been collected. So, yeah, and they finally, they hem and hawed, but then they finally put it in the Miami repository, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was there. 
Um, I mean, NSF usually requires data management plans in yeah. proposals. And, yeah. You know, you and I mean, typically they them. will give you for especially cruises and things like that. There's like a one or two year time limit so that people can get their story together before they put their data available. But yeah, if you're not following your data plan, then it's not going to be published. Well, I think we should officially close out since I told people that that would be were, they were only obligated until five. If anybody's willing to hang around and discuss a bit more, the class actually uh, uh, continues. So the members of the class, if you'll hang around, and we can discuss a little bit more about uh, uh, maybe what's the term where you de, uh, debrief debrief, debrief. 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 Uh, about, the, about what, what you learned here today thank you oh and uh, for those for the audience Rick Kristen and possibly Craig Pittman oh cool and I still have a couple more to find in terms of, of uh, we're going to have on I said on uh, the